Good morning, church. It's good to see you on this beautiful, beautiful day. In the hymn we're about to sing, it says, The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. Our one foundation is Jesus Christ, nothing else. It's not because we live in the same community, that's convenience. It's not because we like each other, because that's not always the case. It's not because we're Americans, it's not because uh, we dress alike, it's because of Jesus Christ. And if you think about how influential Jesus is, you think about Twitter or X, And how many millions of followers might follow a celebrity, right? 120 million followers. Jesus Christ, billions, two point something billion followers of Jesus Christ in the world today. And that's just today, not history. Think about how many buildings have been named after you. Do you have any buildings named after you? I've never donated enough money to a college to get a a, a building named after me. There's benches, right? We have the Eric Wilder bench. Hey, Eric's got a bench named after him. How many churches are dedicated to the name of Jesus today? Millions upon millions. Jesus is the most influential person in history. Hands down. And every Sunday, which is called the Lord's Day, the church gathers around the world to proclaim this one message, that he is our foundation. So let that be in your hearts today. As we worship, as we uh, fellowship afterwards, and as we hear the preaching of the word, it is for Christ that we are here, and only for Christ that we are here. Everything else is an overflow of the abundance of the grace that he has given us. Uh, This week is a wonderful week because we are preparing for VBS. So immediately after the service, any hands, we have some things that need to be moved downstairs, classrooms to get uh, prepped. So uh, we have some heavy tables. If you are a teacher of VBS, uh, we would love you to be in your classroom so that we can uh, real quick determine if you need tables or not. Just say yes or no, and we move them in or move them out. Uh, How many chairs you think you need. Uh, we have a big table in the conference room that needs to be shifted. That's, that takes a lot of hands. Um, so uh, if you can help anybody afterwards, that would be wonderful. Be praying, please, for VBS for one week from uh, tomorrow we start. And uh, hundreds of people are part of that. Uh, so please pray strong, good weather, good attitudes, and that the gospel is clearly presented and that the soil is ready for the seed to be planted there. And with that, would you please rise for the call to worship? And then you will remain standing for him 277 in a moment. We are the children of God. And if we are his children, we are his heirs. And if we are his heirs... We are members of the body and fellow partakers in the promise of Christ. And what promise of Christ? In life everlasting. Please turn into your hymnals to 277, the church's one foundation.
Before we continue, let's turn and greet one another with the love of Christ. Let's put that uh, picture of Butch up there, Mike, if you will. Uh, there's Butch Dickerson. Butch died July 20th, Saturday, a week ago, and uh, we're going to have a memorial service for Butch uh, here at the church on sep September the 7th, all right? That's a Saturday at 2 o'clock. Butch, for those of you that uh, didn't know Butch, he's been a member here for over 50 years. He was a, an interim pastor here at Trinity twice, and he was a, a vibrant part of our church, uh, the teaching ministry, and so many things. Uh, Butch was involved with starting a number of missions, and so he, he's kind of weaved through the fabric of this church over the years. And so I encourage you to come out and put on your calendar uh, to come to celebrate together with the family. In fact, one of his uh, sons, Will Dickerson, is a missionary in Hungary, and so Will will be here and the whole family. So that's Saturday the 7th. It's not Labor Day weekend, all right, in case you're wondering, at 2 o'clock. But one of Butch's favorite hymns, he had a lot of them, was May the Mind of Christ Our Savior, and we'll be singing that today, uh, well, to the glory of God, but also in uh, commemoration of Butch and his many years of faithful service. Uh, he's now in heaven with his wife and so many others, and I'm starting to get choked up, so I better stop talking about Butch. Next, next Sunday, David Thompson will be here, missionary from Brazil, and he'll be preaching, and so please uh, uh, look forward to that, um, and uh, let's, let's go to prayer. Let's pray. Loving, eternal God, we thank you so much that you are our, our God, our Savior. You are our loving, eternal, heavenly Father. You've sent your Holy Spirit to indwell us, and your church is a temple in which your Spirit dwells. We are so honored to be together uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide us as we pray, as we sing, as we greet one another, as we hear your word preached and applied in our lives. Give us receptive hearts to all that you want to teach us and grow us. We pray for that working of your spirit to renew our minds, those uh, things in our life that need to uh, be renewed. We pray for your joy to fill our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, you came to give us life, and life more abundantly. May we experience the abundance of life that comes from, through faith in Christ, and we pray for a saving work in the lives of your people here today, a sanctifying work, a strengthening work, a renewing work. Lord, as we pray, we thank you for Butch Dickerson, we thank you for uh, his faithful life of over 88 years. We thank you, Lord, for how you have used him for the advancement of your kingdom, not only in Bolton, but around the world. And we're grateful. 
and we're encouraged and we're challenged to, to also be used of you in our corner of the world. We pray your blessing upon the family as they celebrate his life and mourn his passing. But we thank you that we do not grieve as the world grieves that has no hope. For our hope is stayed upon Christ, and he is the foundation of this church and the church of Christ around the world. Father, we, as we pray, we pray for Vacation Bible School, and we thank you for uh, our coordinators, our teachers, uh, all the work that has gone into preparing for this year's VBS. We pray, Lord, your anointing upon this week together. Draw the children here. Uh, draw us together. That weave our hearts together as one as we all come to sing and, and proclaim uh, the Lordship of Christ. And we pray for your blessing upon this outreach here at Trinity Church. Father, we continue to pray for a number of folks, uh, for Katie, for Tanya, for Jasa, Altair, for Robin B. and Robin L. Lord, stretch forth your healing hand and, and these and so many more. We thank you that you are a healing God and you are a sustaining God and that you're a miracle-working God, and we call upon you. We pray for wildlife, young life. We pray for Josh Stolzfus and those that are in Saranac, New York, this weekend. We pray your blessing upon the, the wildlife ministry, uh, part of Young Life, and we pray for the many uh, adolescents that are part of this church that are there in Saranac and, and beyond. Father, do a great work, we pray, in the lives of our kids. Pray for unity in our church body, and we pray for next Sunday as David Thompson comes and preaches your word. We thank you that we have the opportunity uh, to uh, welcome him and his wife from Brazil Inland Mission, and we pray your blessing upon that. Father, hear us further as we uh, sing the Lord's Prayer together. Over the summer, we uh, feature a hymn story, and today's hymn story is the Know We're Christians by Our Love, and uh, you can find it in your hymn book 284, uh, and invite you to remain seated as we sing that, and, uh, or you can also sing it with the words that will be projected for you, um, and I hope that you take the time to read that hymn story. Uh, 1966 when it was written, so it was a more recent one. Sometimes we think to be a hymn, it has to be over 200 years old, but that's not the case. 
Well, let's sing this together as we worship God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are eternally one, and that you have and can make us one in Christ. And just as you have made Gentiles and Jews one in Christ, and in marriage you have made a husband and a wife one, you are a God who restores and a God who makes one. 
Lord, may that be the mission of our church to unify all those around this world who do not yet know Christ to come into the church. So, Lord, bless the funds that are donated through tithes and offerings to this church to make that mission real in this community and around the world. For it is Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Privileged to be here with you all today. And I ask you to join me in opening your Bibles as we continue in worship to, and uh, listen to the reading and read ourselves uh, the very true Word of God. So let's get our Bibles out. Uh, we're turning first to our Old Testament reading, which is Isaiah chapter 49, beginning in verses uh, verse 5. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 5. So hear now the very true word of God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Our gospel reading this morning is from John chapter 10. John chapter 10, starting in verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Our New Testament reading is from <clears throat> the book of Ephesians chapter 3. <clears throat> the first six verses. Ephesians chapter 3, starting verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you, Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is 
the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the, Holy, by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. Heavenly Father, come and meet with us as your word is opened. We pray you give us listening ears and listening hearts, and we pray that you do that work you want to do in us to the glory of your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name we pray, amen. Today we're looking at Ephesians 3, 1 to 6, and there's something very appealing about a good mystery. I don't know if you like mysteries or not, a, a mystery novel or a good mystery TV show where the ingenious uh, sleuth figures out uh, who committed a murder or new revelation takes place in decoding something that was unexplained phenomena, and perhaps you have your favorite uh, mystery show or novel. 
In this morning's text from Ephesians 3, 1 to 6, the Apostle Paul shares with the church community at Ephesus how God has revealed an answer to a great mystery concerning his purposes with humanity. He says in verse 4, the mystery of Christ has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to God's uh, holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are now heirs together with Israel, members of one body, shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Well, this is a summary here of what he's already spoken of in chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, in which he has just spoken of in detail. As you look at the beginning of this uh, passage, he begins to talk about like he's about to pray and move into a prayer. And then he diverts, and he, go, he goes back to recapping about this mystery of the Jews and the Gentiles. You say, what's going on here? So, sort of like, do you ever have a, a rabbit trail? Something goes through your mind, and you start, and then you, you go back? Well, that's kind of what he does when he gets uh, to, to verse after 14, he'll dive back into the prayer, so we'll save that for when we get there. So here we see is a summary statement of Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, and which he just spoken of in detail. Jew and Gentile are reconciled to God and to each other through faith in the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Both Jew and Gentile were once far away from God, estranged from communion with God but now have peace with God and with one another, forming a brand new family, the family of God together. And together they become a temple, a temple of God where he dwells by his Holy Spirit. Now the Greek word here is musterion, musterion which means mystery. Now this is not just a mystery novel now, this is, means something a little different, a lot different actually. It's a mystery, something that's beyond natural knowledge, beyond deduction. All right, I'm going to, it's, it's elementary, Watson, all right? Here's the deduction. No, it, this, is, this is something different. This is a mystery that has been opened up, not by human deduction, but by divine revelation, by the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks of other mysteries as well, great spiritual mysteries that have been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Well, there's the great mystery of the incarnation of God from Colossians 2. This great mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, the fullness of the deity of God lives in bodily form. Well, that's a mystery, isn't it? A mystery of the incarnation of God himself in Christ. Well, there's another mystery, Romans 11, the great mystery of Israel's unbelief until the fullness of the Gentiles put their faith in Jesus unto salvation. We can read about that in Romans 11:25. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles have come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So here's another mystery that's revealed by the Holy Spirit. Well, how about the great mystery, the bodily resurrection of God's people, the second coming of Christ? We read that in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Paul says there, listen, I tell you a mystery. Will not all sleep? Will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. Death will be swallowed up in victory. So again, here's another mystery that's been revealed by the Holy Spirit through the apostles and the prophets. Well, now the great mystery of Jew and Gentile, possessing the surpassing riches of the indwelling, indwelling Christ, the hope of glory, guaranteeing future glory. That's from Colossians 1.26. The mystery has been hidden for ages and generations, but now has been disclosed to the Lord's people. God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery to you, Gentiles, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 
Now, this great mystery was promised by God long ago through the prophets. Uh, Isaiah will put that scripture up for you. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So here's this promise of God. His salvation will go to the ends of the earth, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. And he's going to use Israel uh, as his mouthpiece. He's going to use Israel as a light to the world that all may know that it's all about Jesus, the Messiah. It's all about Jesus, God's Son. And He's the one that we find salvation in. So so there's this glimpse of God's purposes given in the Old Testament, revealing that God's purposes for His people Israel was greater than themselves. Think about that. God's purpose for you is greater than yourself. It's greater than yourself. His purpose for Trinity Church is greater than ourselves. He has a greater purpose reaching people for Christ in our neighborhoods, in our community, and around the world. God has always had a marvelous plan for the Gentiles. Paul says, by the administration of his grace, this mystery God has made known to me by his revelation, this mystery of Christ which has not been made known to people in other generations, has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit that through the gospel, Gentile believers not only are saved, but also become heirs together with Jewish believers in Christ, together forming one body, shares in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, this was a new and far-reaching truth that most of the Ephesian believers found it difficult to comprehend and even more difficult to accept. Can I accept this? I mean, wait a minute. We've been separate for so long. You know, there's the Jews over there. They do their thing. The Gentiles over here, we do our thing. They eat their food. We eat our food. They have their custom. We have our custom. They have their dress. We have our dress. Wait a minute. We're supposed to be one? How in the world is this supposed to happen? How in the world? I don't get this. This is hard for me to take in. The first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul is laying down doctrinal groundwork for the practical application that comes to chapters 4 through 6. So you say, why all this theology? Why all this doctrine, these first three chapters? Well, uh, there's a good reason. It's, it's, It's difficult. No, it's impossible for us to apply God's Word if we don't understand what the Word is saying to begin with. Before we get to the practice, we have to understand the doctrinal groundwork. Uh, And when we get to chapter 4, we'll see the church is to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's one body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism. So that's the first thing right out of the gate. This is what I want you to do. Unify. Come together. You're saying, wait a minute. Well, Why should we do that? Have you not been paying attention to chapters 1 through (laughs) 3? I gave you all the reason for it. Now you got all the spiritual, the doctrine. Now do it. Do it. Give yourself to unity in the church. One, One body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism. True application of God's truth can only come after spiritual knowledge and proper doctrine is properly understood. Then it can be applied. That call to living for Jesus, a life that is worthy of our calling in chapter 4 and following, is based on the marvelous plan of God. This mystery revealed that through the gospel, Gentile believers become one body together with Jewish believers in Christ as Messiah, Lord, and Savior. Now, what is the gospel that unites together Jew and Gentile? What is the gospel? What is it? that unites together Jew and Gentile, this gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus says it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
He also preached the gospel of the kingdom, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Apostle Paul describes the gospel this way, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the foremost, but I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. In the book of Acts, Paul addresses the Ephesian elders with these words concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel? Romans 1 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. There's only one gospel. It's important that we get it right. It's important that we get it right. Of course, there are other so-called gospels out there, but the better you know the true gospel, the easier it will be to recognize the counterfeits and the distortions. There's only one true gospel, the gospel of Christ, Jesus, which includes, one, who is Jesus? He is the Christ. He is God incarnate. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. He's the King. The one true gospel says, what has Jesus done? He died on the cross in our place. He rose from the dead. This is the work of salvation, what Christ did to save humanity. Thirdly, why has Jesus done this? He's done this to forgive your sins, bestow on you the benefits that come with salvation. How can you know that is true? Because it fulfills the Old Testament scriptures. Many eyewitnesses have testified to Jesus' bodily resurrection. And how should you respond with repentance? That is, turning away from your sins or sins and turning to God, putting your faith and your trust in the complete work, completed work of Christ. Through the one true gospel, the gospel of Christ, Paul says, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members of one body, shares in the promise of Christ Jesus. Now here's a summary I I put together for you. The gospel is the good news that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, such that all who repent of their sins and put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ's atoning death on the cross will be saved, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit, receive God's gift of grace, forgiveness of sins, a life that is rich and full and abundant here and now, and in the life to come, eternal life in Christ Jesus. Romans 10 says this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. How does God bring people together? I know if you've been watching the Olympics or or not, uh, some interesting things going on in the the whole thing and and, uh, talking about coming together, bringing the world together. What brings the world together? And, and, you know, they're singing an Olympic hymn and, uh, and, and they're singing... Uh, a song by John Lennon and his plays, you know, wouldn't it be great if there's no religion? Wouldn't it be great if there's, if there's no, uh, no countries? And Maybe I'm a dreamer, but maybe I'm not the only one. Let's just come together. What is it that brings people together? How does God bring people together? He sent his son, Jesus, into the world to pay the ransom for our sins so that by his grace through faith, we may become reconciled to God to one another. Peace with God, peace with our neighbor, together embracing the boundless riches of Christ. That's that's how God does it. 
That's how God brings together the world, the people, through Christ. This metaphor of the church as one body. Sorry about that. Sometimes my computer is just too smart. It thinks that I want to I wanna check email in the middle of a sermon. Sorry. <laughs> You're wrong. I don't want to check email in the middle of a sermon. Right. Sorry. Anyway. 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has been members, and all the members of the body, uh, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. The ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where, where would be the sense of hearing? whole body were an ear, where it be the sense of smell. But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. God has arranged the members of the body as he has chosen. That includes both Jew and Gentile together, slave and free together, rich and poor, male and female together, given various spiritual gifts, so that together we can share the good news of the gospel with people in our neighborhoods, and community, and in our world. Romans 12 says this, For as in one body we have many members, the members do not have all the same function. Guess what? We're not all called to the same function. This week I was, uh, thought I'd be, have a, a little fun activity uh, with my uh, three of our grand, granddaughters we caught three frogs, and uh, you know I, I'll, I'm all about you know competition and racing, and and so it's like it's obvious what you do with three frogs. <laughs> you got three granddaughters, you have a race. That's that's what you do, and so I said, all right, girls, one is three, another is three, another is five, and so you got to know your audience here. I'm thinking, all right, how hard how hard is this? I'm gonna make I'm gonna you're gonna stand here with a net over the frog, and then Grampy is going to say go, you're going to lift the net, and then you're going to just kind of coax the frog along. And here's the finish line, all right? all right, I'm putting a finish line. This is what you need to do. They need to come this way over the line and jump back into the pond. It's like, uh, Grampy's going to video it. it. It's going to be priceless. This is going to be one that's going to, you know, we're going to keep and show it on your baccalaureate when you, laureate when you graduate, and we're going to show it for the, you know, I, I have all these things in my mind. I said, are you ready to go? Go. Well, one little girl, a uh, little Maya, she was all over it. She, her, her frog was going in the right direction. Summer was like, frogs? I don't want to touch this thing. I want to, I want to go the opposite direction of this frog. And then, wait a minute, now, it's supposed to go this way. And, and Avani, she's, she's more mature, she's older, she, she, she's got it. So she's trying to get this, this frog to go, but it's not cooperating. So she's watching her younger sister beat her. So what do you do when you're losing to your younger sister? You pick up the frog and you throw it. <laughs> anyway, Fadi, you can't do that. You got to play by the rules. You got to just coax it on. She said, but my, my frog, it's not jumping where I want it to go. And she starts crying, and we have a major meltdown. I said, it didn't go quite the way I imagined it in my mind. So as I looked at that, I said, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing three-year-olds and five-year-olds in vacation Bible school. Let's leave it to the, to the real professionals out there, all right? We all have our place in, in the body, and God has shown me it's not with three-year-olds and five-year-olds because you'll, you'll scar them for life. Anyway, we keep trying. We keep trying. But praise the Lord for the body, that together we can all find our place.
that we can come and we can, we can minister together, having gifts that God has given to us. Some, some, are, uh, some are service or serving or teaching, exhorting or exhortation or contributing and generosity, one who leads with zeal, one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let's use those spiritual gifts that God has given us in proportion to our faith. May we share the great mystery of Christ. Through the gospel, people may come together, may become one body, shares together in the promise in Christ. What is the promise in Christ that we all share on equal terms, Jew and Gentile? The promise of life more abundantly, rich and full, filled with joy and love, overflowing by the Holy Spirit, forgiveness of sins, freedom in Christ, eternal life in Christ Jesus, the hope of glory. Well, let's stand together as we bow in prayer. Let's stand together. Oh, Lord, it's good to laugh. It's, it's good to cry. It's good to uh, use our emotions. It's good to come together and to read and study and apply your word in our life. Thank you, Lord, for your grace that has drawn us unto yourself. Thank you for your mercy that has been extended to us, that we would confess Christ as Lord and Savior, receive the gift of forgiveness of our sins, receive the gift of life everlasting, and to be indwelt with the Holy Spirit, to have peace with God and together become brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of our backgrounds, we have become one, one in Christ. Unify us, Lord. Unify us as our focus is upon Christ and, and, and the work of the gospel. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, this opportunity to study your word. And we pray that you would do a, a continued work, binding our hearts together in Christ Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a final hymn, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's written in your bulletin, if I can find my bulletin. There it is. I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord, great hymn 280. Let's sing that together as we conclude our service. Wesley, I have a word for you. You instructed all the teachers to go get down to their classes, so please remember that, uh, that you can be there to, to share whatever needs to be moved in your room.
the sixth grade class that I'm doing is good to go. So I won't be down there. I'll be visiting with the folks. All right. Thank you. Receive now the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So by the power, uh, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and have an awesome day.